by CNBC special correspondent Jane Wells. Woohoo! <laughs> 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're going to dive right in because there's so much to cover. Wall Street estimates that the space business right now is worth $350 billion. Merrill Lynch predicts that within 30 years it will be worth nearly $3 trillion. But 2048 is a long ways away, and I can't tell you how many times over the last 15 years I've been given some sort of timeline, promise, mm -hmm. whatever, about space that has yet to be delivered. So here we're going to talk about today about what is being done. We're at a really interesting time now where, okay, maybe we're not going to get to Mars. Elon Musk says he's going to have cargo missions there perhaps as early as 2022. I'm not putting my money there yet but that'll be wonderful if it happens. But in the meantime, we're starting to really see smaller baby steps uh, come together on the private enterprise. And so what we're gonna talk about today with this, just across the spectrum, these experts, is what are the expectations in the short term? Where is the money being made? Where can you invest? What is NASA's role in this? Because NASA just got a nice raise. And what are you gonna do with that? <laughs> So well, let's dive in. I'm not going to give their whole bios because you can read about them. You already know who they are. But I'm going to start with a question for each of them, and it is starting big. Again, Musk says he'll have cargo missions to Mars by possibly 2022, manned flights after that. Uh, President Obama, then President Obama, suggested that human space flights to Mars could happen by the mid-2030s. Who's going to get to Mars when? Will it be an American, and will it be from NASA or SpaceX? Uh, we might as well start with NASA. Phil McAllister, you are the Director of Commercial Space Flight Development. Who gets there first, win, and private or astronaut? Yeah, so I think um, assumed in your question was that it would be the U.S., and I think a lot of other countries have aspirations in space. So uh, we'll see. Uh, Mars is definitely in our focus. We're calling it our horizon goal. And we were focused on um, a plan and architecture to get us to Mars, humans to Mars, in the mid-2030s. Um, we just now got a little bit of a refocus on the moon, so we are now fleshing out our plans to go back to the lunar surface with people. Um, so we'll see. We haven't uh, redone the architecture for when we're going to get back to Mars. So we're still saying the mid-2030s. And I think uh, it'll probably be some combination of government and the private sector. When you say who's going to get there first, I don't think any one company or any one country can do it all by itself. I think it's going to be a combination of the private sector and the government uh, to get us there. Just one quick follow-up. Will it be an American? How important is it that somebody else doesn't get to back to the moon or to Mars first. Right. I think consistently uh, we have wanted in the U.S. to be a leader in space. So I think it is very important to not only um, the citizens but our stakeholders as well as our elected officials that NASA continues and the U.S. continues to lead in space. I think that's going to be pretty important. And maybe our security. We'll talk about uh, that in a moment. Jennifer Lopez. Yes, we have our own J-Lo here. Um, <laughs> who is actually a bigger rock star. Uh, you lead commercial innovation technology at the Center for Advancement of Science and Space, which basically supports research on the uh, space station for things that can be commercialized, if I haven't. When are we getting to Mars? Oh, uh, well, um, I, I, just to dovetail on, on Phil's answer, I think um, it, 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 it probably see a mix of both uh, government and, and private. Um, and hopefully, I mean, the, the estimation, as you said, is within the next... Uh, 10 years or so, but I think if, if we continue to build this ecosystem and, and the sustainable marketplace and make sure that we're bringing in all the commercial providers, our, our launch providers and implementation partners, um, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier, uh, to, to build that support across, across the board with different industries, I think it could be possible to see something soon. Based on the experiments on the space station, what is the, the biggest challenge getting there? Is it radiation or, or loss of bone density? Well, I'll start with, uh, I've, just to, to back up a little bit, um, for, for those that, and also as a friendly reminder, that, that, that this International Space Station is the greatest uh, human and uh, human technological uh, achievement in our history. And uh, it's, it's a complex, uh, or uh, it's one of the most complex scientific and engineering projects uh, uh, and the largest structure to be put into space by, by humans so far. Uh, space agencies from Canada, Japan, Russia, 
uh, uh, US and 11 countries in Europe all came together to build this incredible place uh, uh, to demonstrate the convergence of science, technology, uh, human innovation, research breakthroughs that are just not possible here on Earth. So uh, at CASIS, or Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, uh, we were instated in 2011 uh, through a bipartisan cooperative agreement from US Congress uh, to, or designated to, man to manage the, the International Space Station, particularly the US segments, uh, or the ISS National Laboratories. So um, as, as part of that, you know, we, we work very closely with our NASA uh, partners, our service providers, our launch providers, and um, uh, implementation partners uh, to, to drive, you know, essentially driving demand. On the, we're on the front lines driving this demand with commercial companies, uh, entrepreneurs, startups, uh, government agencies, and um, our academic partners, university but, partners. But you're trying to figure out how we can live in space, right? Isn't that what the R&D really and that's what I was going to mention, is, yeah. is I wanted to sort of set the stage. Uh, but, but yes, we, that's exactly what we're focusing on. It's analogous to what our NASA partners are looking at, more so for deep space exploration missions, where we're trying to uh, bring the benefit for life you know, back on Earth and seeing how we can implement some of these uh, areas of R&D and technology advancement, scientific research, and life sciences, um, uh, t uh, technology development, uh, materials, physical sciences, remote sensing, earth observation, aerospace technology development to see how we can accelerate and, and bring value back to these companies here on Earth. So we're seeing a lot of demand on that side. So and I have the, the stats for that, but I'll wait. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to, but back to the question, what is the biggest challenge of living uh, out there? Well, when you were mentioned about radiation, another area that we're, radiation is, is one of those uh, areas, but bone loss and muscle wasting. Uh, unfortunately, we have to continue to exercise in space, so <laughs> if there's no, yes, if the, if the, the crew is uh, exercising at least two hours a day uh, to ensure that that, um, uh, that... How do you that exercise in space? You know, like there's... What do you <laughs> With uh, the, well, we have um, uh, sort of pulleys, yep, we have pulleys <laughs> and, and we have a, um, uh, a treadmill, so we're able to use the, oh, the treadmill and, and sort of weights. I feel like you could probably answer to this too. So, um, but what, what's interesting about that is, you know, and also to let the audience and those watching know that uh, essentially in, in a microgravity environment or in a space environment, you know, because we're exposed to this, this unique phenomena, our biological systems are affected. So it's almost equivalent to, you know, the, the crew, it's been reported that they can lose up to 30% of uh, bone strength. It's equivalent to a 70-year-old osteoporotic woman here on Earth. And it's about one to two percent per month. Wow. So, so we're, we're we're looking at those areas, working with a number of pharma biotech companies, uh, and and seeing some interesting research and results. Um, looking at uh, anti anti myostatin uh, antibodies, uh, novel osteoporosis therapeutics, and and trying to see how we can drive some of these areas wow. that will impact deep space exploration missions or long duration space flight, and also to impact us here on Earth. Will Marshall, you've gone from. NASA to the private sector, you are the CEO of Planet Labs. You co-founded the company, correct? That's true, yeah. Which you've got, what, the most little cube sats of anyone up there? And the most satellites in human history, yeah. How many? Uh, we have just over 200 satellites in orbit, uh, a All fleet of about 190 medium resolution satellites and then 13 high resolution satellites. You're finding a great market in Earth mapping, forget looking at Mars, but planet, you know, we still have a planet that actually we, we, functions. We, we're trying to use space to help People down here, yeah, primarily, although I have lots of interests up there too. What do you think about when we're going to get to Mars and who's going to get there? Well, it's definitely, I have strong opinions on this. It's going to be the moon first, uh, and n n Mars, I think, is a, is a little bit of a distraction. Um, the moon is the obvious place to put a settlement. A lot of people go, oh, we've been to the moon, therefore, why would we need to go back there? Let's go to Mars next. But it's like, these are, those were just the first people to go there very quickly just to check it out. But the next stage is not the exploration stage, it's the settlement phase. And um, that's a huge undertaking, and it's much more natural to do that on the moon than Mars, because it only takes a day and a half to get there, rather than eight months, it's only second. Faster second. than the 405? Yeah, it's like, it, it, the, the, <laughs> it's radically easier. It's like, not just a little bit easier, like it's, it's 100 times easier than putting up a base on, on Mars to put it on the moon. And the next step will be to get towards a self-sustainable settlement to back up life and human knowledge uh, in, in case there's calamity down here on Earth. If you like anchoring in human progress, you know, anyone who loses a hard drive knows the calamity of not having a backup. So 
Uh, and I very much believe it will be led by the private sector, um, and it will be done in the early 20s, uh, when, when we, we, are, we have tremendous things that have happened just recently um, on the moon. Um, three major accomplishments of humanity that enable uh, settlement of the uh, permanent uh, self-sustainable settlement on the moon. Uh, one is that the, there were, we discovered large amounts of water on the moon. I was actually a, 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 a scientist on a mission where we sent a small probe, found lots of water on the moon, and most people thought the moon was dry, but it turns out there's lots of water there on the poles in the form of ice. Uh, secondly, we have now the Falcon Heavy rocket, which actually mm. the SpaceX rocket and, and hopefully the new Glenn rocket from uh, uh, Blue Origin will enable us to get humans uh, to the moon and back. So that has, that ha we didn't have a rocket for 50 years that could do that, and now we've got a rocket again that can do that. And furthermore, it's in private hands. And the final thing is that uh, there's been tremendous. It, there really is a space renaissance, and there's a lot of people driving to uh, test new technologies in the private sector. And so I think it's just it's it's taking off. It really is. It, there's a space space 2.0. You know. We've been talking about it, and it now seems to really maybe slowly launching. Of course, the moon, getting to the moon would make it uh, much easier to have it as sort of a great gas station than to go to Mars. You break the hardest part, which is getting out of the Earth's near gravitational pull. But Steve Isakowitz, you are with the CEO of the Aerospace Corporation, which basically you're, you run the federally funded R&D program for space. Do I have that right? Right. When are we getting to Mars, and who's getting there? <laughs> <laughs> well, listening to Will talk reminds me, early in my career, I had a chance to be at NASA, and I was there when we had the Columbia shuttle accident. And of course, we, we lost astronauts from then. NASA was trying to decide, what should we do? Should we continue to build more shuttles, or should we do something with, else with human exploration? Um, we, as a result, we actually put together three teams inside NASA to say what to do next. One team said, it's obvious, go to the moon for the reasons that Will said. It's close by, it may have resources there, there's a lot we can exploit. We had a second team that said, skip the moon, go to Mars, it's the most interesting place, there could still be life there, there might have been life in the past, there's a lot we could learn about the like Earth. Like we've done the moon. Yeah, been there, done that, let's, let's go to Mars. And then we had a third team that said, skip all the human stuff, robotics. <laughs> we could do it all with robots, robots can go to the moon, they can go to Mars, they can go to places that are dangerous, you would never send humans, we'll do it much faster and cheaper if we do it with robots. And we had those three teams brief out. What we concluded from the three teams was all the above. You really wanted to start with robots, as we're doing right now. Saturday, um, yes, NASA Saturday. is launching a mission to Mars called uh, InSight, where they're going to learn about the, the seismic activity on Mars. Um, we're we're, uh, uh, we're going to go to the moon first, as uh, this administration is planning to do. It's the right thing to do. We're going to learn a lot technologically how to go to Mars. But we all have our eye on Mars. Now, to your question, what would be the time frame? I'll just bring it by analogy. Um, so the Human Genome Project. That was a project that was started by the Department of Energy to map the human genome. Here comes Craig Venter, and he says, you guys are too slow in the federal government. I can do it much faster with private funding, and I'm going to do it. And so they competed with each other. That sense of competition massively moved up the date by which they mapped the human genome. Mm -hmm. Now, the end was, they, in the end, they decided to get together to work to map the human genome. So in, at the end, it turned out to be a public-private partnership. I think we're going to see the same thing here. Elon's going to push it. Others are going to want to push it. The government's going to want to push it, not to be outdone by other countries. In the end, I do think it's going to be a partnership. Do you have a date? Um, I think Phil said it. I think 2030 is probably the safe bet to do it, and the 2020s would be pretty aggressive. I find that interesting because it's such a huge investment for the private sector. There is so much to risk. I mean, why then? Why? Uh, this is the sort of thing that a government taxpayer supported. I, I disagree. Um, uh, we did an analysis showing that we could get a self-sustainable settlement on the moon for a couple of billion dollars, which nowadays is in the you know, pocket change for a few, few, few people in the cool, Bay Area. In the, well, in the space industry. <laughs> Including some in the space industry, but mainly, mainly in the okay. IT industry. So I, I think that that's, it's going to happen pretty soon because uh, half of those uh, billionaires are space geeks. Uh, and speaking of the private sector, by the way, how commercial is space getting? This administration has tasked the Commerce Department with figuring out a plan to avoid collisions in space. Not the Pentagon, 
not the Defense Department, the Commerce Secretary is going to lead the policy on coming up with traffic, a traffic control plan for space. <laughs> that is amazing to me, speaking of the private sector. Uh, Chad Anderson here, you really are, you're doing all kinds of startups with Space Angels. Um, you've invested in a million different things. The people in this room may be more interested in you and what you have to say than a lot of the others because you are putting money that they may want to also invest in. But from yep. your perspective, Mars, when, and who? <laughs> and do you care? <laughs> Yeah, there is um, there's so much opportunity right now in space. Um, Mars is one of those opportunities. Uh, we are uh, we invest across the spectrum in space. So um, the things that I'm excited about, I'm excited about for different reasons. Mars, I'm excited about for different reasons than I'm excited about, for instance, uh, what's happening in existing markets like uh, satellites and launch. What Will's doing, I'm very excited about. What Will's doing with Planet Labs, I'm very excited about. Um, everything across the satellite value chain, from uh, the revolution in small satellites, uh, the largest constellation in human history, allowing us to look, uh, have an updated dynamic view of our world for the first time in history. Um, and the entire value chain that supports that from bringing the data down to distributing that data and getting it into the hands of people, it's going to revolutionize the way that business is handled um, in the same way that GPS did, uh, I feel. And so there is an unprecedented new data set that's affecting, it's going to touch every piece of our lives. And so there's opportunity from a financial and impact perspective in the satellite side that is huge. Um, and then there is um, uh, how do those new sensors and those satellites get up into space and get replenished. And so there's a ton of opportunity on the launch side, um, on the small launch side. And so we're seeing new uh, small launch vehicles come online. Um, at the same time that we're seeing larger launch vehicles come online um, driven by the private sector. And then there's a gap in the middle that's now being opened up. And so different types of launch vehicles for different types of situations, whether it's small satellites, uh, deep space missions, human uh, space flight. And those are just the existing um, markets, right? So those are hundreds of billions of dollars that exist today that are being disrupted by entrepreneurs that are doing things better, faster, cheaper. But there's all kinds of new markets that are opening up as well. We've invested in uh, the leading provider of commercial space station services, uh, who is operating. Who's that? Nanorex. Mm. They are making money today, good money today. Doing um, what? Uh, all kinds of things. So if you see videos of uh, Will's uh, satellites being kicked out of the space station, uh, that's Nanorex. Um, they, yep. they, they do like release, satellite release stuff. They I do. They have a spring loaded cannon. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and so there's beautiful video if you haven't seen it. They open up the airlock and then they shoot. They it's shoot satellites. We, we have the, the sa astronauts throw cool. the satellites out the window. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not quite as simple as that. But <laughs> right. right. We don't like the word cannon. Though, yeah. On exactly. the space station, that makes us nervous. Yeah. What's the most interesting <laughs> investment? Uh, the most interesting company you have money in right now? Well, the, uh, so I'm interested for lots of different reasons, right? Those other ones are very. <clears throat> Financial impact focused. Uh, the space station is very interesting, especially as we talk about transitioning uh, to a commercial space station. We're going to have multiple space stations, outposts, whatever you call it, in orbit. Um, uh, manufacturing in space, we're very interested in that. It allows you to do a lot more, um, build larger structures in space, um, which people are spending a lot of money to do on the ground today. We've invested in lunar transportation. So, um, and this is this is one of the great examples of um, how, c how close we are, how much work's already been done, um, and, and what's upcoming and what you can expect. So uh, this is a small lander, um, uh, a small entrepreneurial team out of Carnegie Mellon, spun out of Carnegie Mellon. Um, and they have developed a lander. They're now sponsored by DHL. They're working with NASA. They're working with Airbus. And they're launching on a ULA rocket in a year and a half. What's it called? What's the name of the company? Astrobotic. And how much have you put in? Uh, so they've done a two and a half million dollar round so far, and they've done, they've been able to do so much more because they're working with NASA and they're getting grants and and um, uh, funding. They've gotten sponsorship. <laughs> um, but I guess for the people in this room, where do you, if hey, I want to invest in that. Yeah. How do you do that? Well, here's. 
Um, there's a couple of, so you do it through space angels is the, is the short answer. But, <laughs> How um, much do you need to get into space angels? I mean, you want to know somebody who understands the market and who is able to help navigate and, like, and weed out the uh, snake oil salesmen in this really exciting new sector and be able to find the, you know, the nuggets of, of true opportunity, understand the real risks and opportunities. But there's two common misconceptions in space. Um, normally, that, the, uh, that space companies take a lot of money to fund. Uh, to get up and going, and that you know that there's no real exit or return on investment in the future. So we have a ton of great data on venture capital generally, and we have um, a database of every private transaction in space. And if you look at the data, it, space companies need about the same as general tech companies, right? At the seed stage, they're taking in $2 million. At the Series A, they're taking in $10 million. At the Series B, they're taking in $20 million. It's, it lines up um, uh, right on par with general technology investments. Yep. And then if you look, the, the companies that we invest in, um, again, going back to the misconceptions, we don't invest in warp drive or, or you know, um, some kind of interstellar travel. We're investing in businesses. Um, and what that means for us is that we are investing in companies that have a prototype and have customer traction. And again, there's so much government support for, um, for commercial companies that, that they're able to do this. By the time they get to us and we invest at the seed stage and we put a couple of million dollars in, they already have a prototype. They're already generating revenue. 80% of the uh, companies in our portfolio are generating revenue and have proven technology. Right? So, and, if you, and, and, and because they have stronger fundamentals, they generate more revenue than general technology investments. Hmm. And then when you get to exit, no kidding, the average exit in space is nine times higher than the average in exit. You mean in exit. altitude higher? <laughs> and how many exits have there been? <laughs> so um, what are we tracking? 160 or something? We, we have a report, a quarterly space investment report, where we... Where we talk about all of these numbers. I think it's somewhere a little bit less than 200. But we track everything since 2009. It was a key turning point for us. We call it the dawn of the entrepreneurial space age, where um, SpaceX launched their first successful commercial payload. They brought the price uh, 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 down significantly. And they also published their pricing and brought transparency to a market where there wasn't any before. So it really they get a lot of credit because they brought the barriers to entry down, which allowed for entrepreneurs um, to rush in. Uh, but have there been exits? Have there? There been have. So uh, since 2009, we're tracking um, 26 billion, I think, 160 exits. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, of course, SpaceX wouldn't have gotten anywhere without 1.6 billion dollars in NASA funding to get it off the ground, which is from all of us. So, I want to ask. Everybody, I'm going to start with you, Phil, again. Uh, what is the most interesting thing you are working on right now? Chad, we sort of covered it with you, but the most interesting thing you're working on right now, and for you, I want to show the video first. Okay. That would be the cue for the NASA. <laughs> <video. laughs> Okay, that gets me pumped up. I could watch that all day long. Um, of all the things you're doing, though, um, what is the most, specifically the most interesting thing to you? Well, right, everything in that video is really uh, cool. So I oversee the commercial crew program, which is what you just saw. When we retired the shuttle in 2011, we no longer had U.S. access to space. So to take our astronauts up to the International Space Station right now, we have to buy a ride on the Russian Soyuz rocket, which is about $80 million a seat, and we've had to do that since 2011. So my program, the Commercial Crew Program, is, in, is partnering with SpaceX and Boeing. We've got the competition model that Steve talked about, which is super effective. I totally agree with that point. Um, they are competing not only on cost, but also on 
reliability and safety, so that has been a very, very effective mechanism for us. So I think what's, what's exciting for me today is we're getting very, very close to seeing those first launches. The first several years I was overseeing the program, that video would have been a bunch of people around meetings, in meetings and around tables and you know PowerPoint slides. There was a bunch of design reviews and a bunch of just design that was going on. And then we sort of evolved and now we're in the test phase. You could say the parachute tests that we've had have been super cool. Um, we're doing a lot of engine testing. Uh, the spacesuits have all been tested now. Um, and so we're getting to the point where hardware is in the factory. Uh, SpaceX has four capsules in development in Hawthorne, just down the road right now. Boeing also has three or four capsules in manufacturing in Kennedy Space Center, uh, Florida right now. So I was just down at Boeing. I saw the hardware. That's been just super, super cool. So hopefully this year, uh, you will see some test flights for the commercial crew program. And I would say sometime within the next 10 to 20 months, we could see our first U.S. human launch again since 2011. So that's going to mm. be super exciting. I cannot wait. And a lot less than $80 million a seat. Yes, uh, <laughs> that's a great point. When Although we the Russians first do it very well. They have been doing it very well. They've been a very good partner for us, but we would rather invest that money, since it's all of our money, into the U.S. aerospace industry. So when we let the contracts, we did an average seat price for Boeing and SpaceX. If we sold all the seats, it was $58 million a seat. Okay. That is amazing, and it shows the ability of the U.S. entrepreneurial sector to be able to do this. That Soyuz rocket has been around for decades. They're not paying off the development of that, and they're charging $80 million. And for the U.S. Uh, companies to be basically starting from scratch and be able to uh, charge NASA about $58 million, it's just been um, amazing and has sort of validated our confidence in uh, the private sector. Jennifer, you uh, partner with the private sector so much uh, with the experiments, the R&D you do up on the space station. What's, what specifically, and I know you also have some facts and figures, but specifically what is the most interesting thing mm -hmm. going on in your opinion? Sure, so well, I, I also wanted to touch briefly just on, on, the, on, the, on the figures. Um, uh, so collectively, just to give you the, this, this uh, sense in terms of scale, uh, collectively, the ISS has enabled more than 2,400 researchers in 83 countries uh, uh, to conduct uh, over 1,700 um, scientific experiments and investigations wow. uh, on the space station, and which is you know, pretty incredible. And, and, and I was mentioning earlier, in terms of the, the uh, cross a variety of disciplines, uh, it's analogous to the CASIS mission, which is uh, you know, life sciences, materials, physical sciences, technology development, which is the portfolio that I oversee and uh, remote sensing, aerospace, uh, tech dev. Um, and uh, I also wanted to quickly mention that in terms of uh, the, the ISIS National Lab portfolio, so all of that, uh, that work and research and experimentation, we've been able to build an incremental revenue uh, at about $900 million since our inception in 2011. And that's continuing wait, wait, to increase. So you've, you've brought in $900 million. Correct. Not just spending money, but well, bringing in a little. The incremental, the, the revenue that, that is the, that value is at $900 million in okay. terms of the projects, yes. Not $900 million uh, revenue that we oh, are. Oh, okay. We, we are uh, <laughs> uh, still funded by, by NASA. I see. Wow, <laughs> making money on the space station. This is awesome. <laughs> well, that is the, that is the, 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 goal. the intent, the goal. Yes. Um, and right now, we're enabling our companies to, to do that. Uh, so the incremental revenue I was mentioning in terms of that $900 million, that's also addressing you know, a, multi, a variety of multi-billion dollar markets where the, the total addressable market value is uh, a, about $110 billion. Um, and just last year, in, in fiscal year 2017, uh, out of all the projects that CASES had awarded, over 70% of those projects were new to space customers. And 60% or over 60% of those were commercial companies. So we're seeing a demand, we're seeing a, a, a continual increase in terms of our commercial partners. And uh, to go back to your question about what's some of the most exciting things that we're working on, um, I'm a little biased because of the technology development side. I already touched a little bit about the life sciences work on the um, uh, uh, bone loss and muscle wasting, but uh, we're also looking at, in terms of uh, life sciences just briefly, um, regenerative medicine, protein crystallization growth, also looking at organ bioengineering capabilities. We're going to be launching a 3D bioprinting or biofabrication facility to the space station coming up in the next couple of years. Well, you're gonna, so 3D printer in the space station. 
Uh, well, we have an additive manufacturing facility up there now. Right. We've been able to print over 200 uh, test uh, or, or uh, prints, coupons, uh, and multi, you know, and polymers, multi-materials. We're now going to be expanding that into alloys and uh, also looking at multi-materials, uh, electronics. Um, and we're also lo uh, launching a recycler pretty soon, and our partners at NASA are, are launching a fab lab as well. They're also launching their own recycler. But the, the interesting part is um, also looking, when Chad was talking, just touching this a little bit earlier, in terms of the, the, the capability of manufacturing in a space environment. Um, you know, that's something that, that we're really excited to see. And there's just this, um, uh, uh, let's say, a, a lot of activity with different companies that are interested in, in these areas. And one in particular, one area in particular that we're looking at is fiber optic uh, fabrication in a microgravity environment. We launched um, a fiber optic uh, fabrication facility uh, to, to station to, to just as a test demo and using a, a Z-Blan uh, material or, or looking at optic uh, optic fibers. Why, why would that be? I mean, I can think of manufacturing in space as saving money because you don't have to build it on the ground and get a rocket that has can fit it in the payload and take it up there. Correct, yes. Uh, so it's better you can take the parts up or whatever and build it up there, correct? But what's, why fiber optic? Why is that? Well, in particular with fiber optics, what's interesting, uh, uh, the, obviously, you know, the, the impacts of, of that from a, a business standpoint are pretty significant. I mean, we're, we're, we're tapping in terms of the telecommunications market that's addressing, you know, seven and a half billion dollars um, in terms of that market. But, but really looking at and leveraging the phenomena of a microgravity environment to see if, if there's any you know, potential tweaks that we can make in that material as we're, we're you know, because the, the, the methodology of it is that you pull this glass um, and, or this fiber, and the, the thought is that you can have a certain order of magnitude less in terms of defects or um, any impurities in terms of the material. Okay. And imagine what that, can, what that can translate to from a, on the ground perspective in terms of data transmission rates or, so those are the types of things, even if we were to tweak that by a certain percentage, wow. what the impacts of that can have. Okay. So we're very early stage, but uh, also really quick to touch on just one other project I'm really excited about, and I'll, um, I'll uh, finish there. But it, um, in terms of our uh, robotics and computing capabilities, uh, we partner with uh, Hewlett Packard or Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and they were able to launch a, a space, uh, a space-borne uh, supercomputer to station. Um, and, and that's also a, a pretty exciting project we're looking at. Uh, they, they've been able to, uh, to conduct over uh, a trillion calculations per second consist uh, consistently. Uh, that's over a teraflop um, in terms of uh, data processing power. So um, they also just uh, recently had announced uh, some contracts with the DOD and, um, and the uh, Air Force uh, National Laboratory and Navy. Uh, and those are pretty substantial contracts for their supercomputers. But that also has implications not just for product development processes on the ground in terms of R&D um, and, and their bottom line, but also in, in, in terms of market share, but for deep space exploration wow. missions with NASA uh, will, and others. For Planet Labs, I know you just learned before you walked in here that uh, Humboldt County supervisors would like to use your Earth observation satellites to monitor the cannabis industry. Yeah. A potential <laughs> hot new market for you. Potentially. Uh, what is the most exciting thing that, that you're working on? Not that. Um, <laughs> oh, no, that's, that, that's actually very cool. Oh, I don't know. Uh, no, 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 it's, it's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Uh, what excites me the most is uh, what the space renaissance is doing for uh, the generation of totally new uh, uh, data sets that were unfathomable mm -hmm. just a few yep. years ago. Um, and now the ap application of artificial intelligence to those data sets. Uh, so what we have done at Planet, just a little bit of background, is we, uh, we, a, a team of us left NASA about six or seven years ago um, to, to miniaturize satellites and launch different sorts of fleets of satellites that could gather sorts, different sorts of data. Um, the particular mission we set ourselves out was to image the entire land mass of the Earth every single day. And so basically give a time axis to satellite imagery. Uh, if you go online and see satellite imagery, you'll see the maps that you find online are typically three or five years old. That's why your house looks old in the imagery. <laughs> we are basically collecting the entire Earth's imagery every day. And we've done that by launching the largest fleet of satellites in history. We've got just over 200 satellites, which image every point on the Earth. Where did Earth's your funding mass. come from? Where did the uh, uh, VCs uh, uh, who, who invested this from a business perspective? Because uh, imagine what, what we have now is a deep stack of imagery, 500 images for every location on the Earth's surface, and we're updating a new layer every day. 
And what that means is that we can track changes as they happen around the planet, and it has a wide variety of commercial and humanitarian use cases. Uh, take agriculture as an example. We can tell, I mean, that's rela relative to, related to the cannabis uh, case you brought up, but uh, agriculture represents 26% of the land area of the Earth. Uh, we can tell crop type and crop yield from orbit, which then helps uh, farmers to improve crop yield by, by knowing when to uh, add water or fertilizer. Uh, we also sell our data to um, big mapping companies, the mapping companies that you see data, uh, satellite imagery layers online to keep their maps up to date. We sell it to governments. We work a lot with NGOs who are trying to track deforestation or, or help with disaster relief. We work with governments like, like uh, uh, um, after the hurricanes and uh, floods and fires, we can have before and after imagery that helps the, uh, the disaster responders. And we can even help local and state governments uh, uh, track cannabis development. <laughs> um, the broader point, though, now is that we haven't just built up this database of 500 l stack of images on each location on the Earth's surface, which documents change as it goes on. Imagine now that we apply AI to that. The same AI that is used uh, by Google to find uh, cats in videos or what have you um, can be used to find uh, objects in our satellite imagery. So imagine in, if, in, if we get about uh, one and a half million 29 megapixel images down from our satellites each day. It's a tremendous new data set uh, uh, that so we have. So don't sunbathe nude in the, back, in uh, the no, backyard. Let, let me be clear. It doesn't really touch personal privacy. We can't see a person. We're at three meters per pixel. Um, so that means you can see a tree, you can see a vehicle, you can't see a person. Okay. Um, uh, and and uh, deliberately for this particular reason. So, um, but now we're applying AI, as I said, so if we can, in each of those millions of images, go, this is a ship, this is a tree, this is a car, this is a road, this is a building, what have you, then we can uh, basically build up a database of what's on the Earth over time. Well, wouldn't this be uh, for intelligence, for the, for the Pentagon, for governments, for the North Koreans? I mean, isn't this all sort of information that is useful to them? Absolutely. Um, so the v a variety of governments are our clients, um, and, and we believe that uh, uh, the more information that gets out there about different activities around the world to all the different parties it tends to reduce uh, tension. Do you have any um, restrictions on whom you can sell data to? I, mean, yeah, I suppose you can't to the Iranians or to the uh, North there's, Koreans. There's, we're, we're subject to general embargoes like that, yes, uh, Iran and North Korea and so forth as a US-based company. Uh, it, and, and in general, we, we follow, uh, uh, we have uh, licenses from NOAA uh, that, that enables us to use and operate Earth imaging satellites in space. Generally speaking, uh, it's international law in space, which means that uh, any, you know, the Russians and the US agreed early in the space industry that anyone could fly over each other's territory and take pictures of each other's landmass. Uh, so it's like not like you have to you know, get permission from all the different countries that you fly over. It's sort of awkward if you, you can't like, fly up to Russia and turn left. You know? I mean, you're kind of in an orbit, you're going to go over it. And, and so <laughs> they figured this out back in the 60s, and now it's international law that anyone can fly over anyone's territory and take pictures. So we take pictures of North Korea, for example, or Iran or whatever. We're not allowed to sell them to those countries, but we can sell them to anyone else, commercial companies, nonprofits, governments. Interesting. Uh, all right, so much to ask you, Steve. <laughs> uh, you know, do we need a uh, do we need a space defense force? Uh, I know you guys are working on intergalactic mm. GPS. Uh, how to? Mi I know you're also working on how to work with all the traffic. If you've got everybody up there flying around, how right. to, of all those things, what's the most intriguing one for you at the Aerospace Corporation right now? Yeah. So there's uh, three mega trends that are going on right now. We spoke to the first one in your first question, which is what's happening in civil space, Moon and Mars. You also asked about commercial. A lot's going on there. The private sector is coming off the, the sideline and really driving a lot of the technological innovation that Will just ran through. But the third me mega trend that's going on is in national security space. So the US military in national security is number one in the world, primarily because of the strength that we bring from space. We rely on GPS to let our soldiers, our bombers, our tanks, and everybody to know where they are. We use communications that are critical in a, an environment anywhere around the world. Uh, we have missile warning to know if North Korea is sending a missile for a test or sending a missile our way. And the US has assumed that s space is like a sanctuary. In other words, we put our satellite up there, and it's forever going to be safe. That changed about 10 years ago when the Chinese demonstrated the ability to fire a missile and blow up one of their own satellites. And suddenly, for the first time, we realized that we can no longer assume that space is a sanctuary. Now, what does that mean? 
a lot of the satellites that we fly are rather big. You know, the earliest days of the space program, I could hold it in my hand. And then they have grown to be about the size of a school bus, and they've grown to be about a billion-dollar satellite. Now, they become, if you will, potentially juicy targets if you want to interrupt. And our U.S. economy depends on GPS, depends on communications, depends on a lot of the, the weather predictions. So what does that mean? So the Aerospace Corporation, around 20 years ago, we looked really hard at how do we reverse some of the trends. One of the ways you change it is you go from really big to many small. Okay, the more you diversify, just like your stock investments, the harder it is to upset what you're trying to do. Right, you can maybe just shoot one down, but you can't right. shoot the whole thing down. So in the year 2000, we launched a satellite that I actually have in my pocket. Yes, it's a satellite in the pocket. This was a PicoSat. We launched it in the year 2000. We just threw it out there in space. It had a radio on it. All it did is beep like the Sputnik. It had a battery, and after three days, it died. Now, it did demonstrate some miniaturization. We had an inertial measurement unit, IMU, frankly, that was the same technology that wound up in our iPhones. So when you turn the screen, it would turn the, your screen accordingly. But you know that was simplistic, but it didn't do much. Now, in the more recent time, <coughs> brought a satellite that oh, doesn't I fit in my props. pocket. Okay. <laughs> so we launched this three years ago. Uh, this is uh, in the form of what's called the CubeSat. Now, what's very different about it, it has solar panels that allows you to get energy from the sun. It also has the ability to point, so you could look at Earth and do some useful things on it. It also has GPS, so you know exactly where it is. We just launched a few months ago a satellite that was just like this, but also had laser communication. We were able to send at 200 megabits per second, high data rates down to the ground, and the ability for the satellites to actually talk to each other and actually begin to fly in formation with each other. Just by moving around in space, they could get closer to each other or further apart. The exciting thing about this is you send up enough of these, it could start to replace some of the bigger satellites. All right, that solves one problem and creates another. <laughs> because now, you know, Sandra Bullock and George Clooney are up there minding their own business, and there are <laughs> thousands and thousands of those things yes. flying around. How do you, what are you doing to navigate that. No, so you're right. So again, one of the reasons why Chad's investing right now is these kind of satellites are not billion dollars. These are, you know, you get kids at universities can go to Silicon Valley, raise a million dollars, build a satellite, launch it, and, you know, and they're in business. So now everyone's talking about getting in with these CubeSats and these very small satellites. And um, a company called OneWeb wants to put up a thousand of these small satellites right. in orbit. Uh, SpaceX is talking about putting up many thousands of satellites. Believe it or not, we now have a traffic jam in space. I believe it. It sounds ridiculous because space is the endless frontier, but if everybody's using the same orbit, just like if everybody gets on the 405, you're going to get a traffic jam. Now, worse than that is because you're going at such high speeds and because there are no lane markers, two satellites that are going in different orbits, if they slam into each other, they would not only destroy the, the, each other, but they will spew debris everywhere. We are literally at a point in space where this matters, where if we are not careful, we could pollute the immediate orbit around Earth so that all these commercial activities will be for naught. So one of the things we're trying to do is better understand how to do that, how to address that space traffic issue. Uh, since, the of America, uh, since the beginning of the space program, there have been 40,000 objects put into space. 20,000 of them are still there. Only 2,000 of them are active. And yet, we actually, th through the Air Force, have to tell the world when satellites get too close to each other. And, and last year, there was 100 times where satellites had to move away for fear that they would slam into each other. And it has happened. A few years ago, two satellites, a Russian and a US satellite, in fact, did slam into each other and tear each other apart. So we're trying to address, through regulations, better ways to do it. And one of the ways we hope to do it at aerospace is actually, maybe in the future, put a GPS on each one of the satellites. So each satellite is so smart to know exactly where it is that we don't have to guess if they're going to slam into each other. We would know precisely. So it is an issue. It's one that needs to be addressed. The good news is the private sector recognizes this, and we are taking steps to address it. Can I, uh, can I add a comment on that? So yeah, the, 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 this is a super critical point. And, and uh, the, the even worse is that not only is there these 20,000 pieces that we track, there's millions of pieces that are much smaller that we don't even know where they are. Uh, but we infer their existence because when we get solar panels down from Hubble that we bring down and there's peppered with holes. <laughs> so we know that there's lots of smaller pieces, but we don't, we don't track them. 
This is a serious problem, but it's mainly a problem in very high altitude orbits. Um, if you go in very low orbits, you can uh, not create a problem because the atmosphere slowly brings everything down. Basically, it's self-cleaning. And so, for example, we put all of our satellites in these very low orbits to ensure that we don't huh. exacerbate this problem. But longer term, when people put up satellites into these higher orbits, so we put our satellites at four, four to 500 kilometers of altitude, where it self-cleans within a couple of years, so it gets out the stuff out of the way. If you put your satellites up at 1,000 kilometers, 1,500 kilometers, uh, it stays up there for hundreds of years, or 50 or 100 years, um, and there you really need to make sure you bring stuff down. And then the question is that even if you put up 1,000 satellites, and that even if you put propulsion on them, um, the problem is, even if one in a hundred fails, the propulsion system fails, which is a conceivable thing, uh, then you still have a lot of s stuff left up there. And so, uh, and we're in this situation where there's a runaway cascade because s satellites and debris are hitting each other regularly enough that it's creating more debris with time than is coming down. And so we have to do something to stop it. A bit, and a bit like climate change, the sooner you nip it in the bud, the better. Uh, but there are actually schemes to reduce that problem. How? Um, well, one scheme, when I, I worked on this problem when I was at NASA for some years, and uh, we, we came up with a scheme using ground-based lasers, not to blow up the pieces in space, but just to nudge them. So you can predict the positions Jeez. of all these thousands of pieces, and if they're going to collide, like you game. nudge one with a laser. Yes, you could, you, could, you, could, you could get people to pay to have a shot or something. <laughs> um, but anyway, so it, you propagate the positions of the, all these objects forward in time. If the two are going to collide or come close, you use a laser just to nudge them enough so that they miss. And by doing that perpetually, it turns out everything just slowly comes down. And you can do that with a couple of lasers on the ground, medium power lasers wow. uh, through telescopes. So this is a problem we can address, but we need to do it soon. Um, and so wow, it I is important. This, this, all right, Chad, what do you think about all this? <laughs> is there Great, a commercial so. opportunity for there? Or are you contributing to the problem? Uh, both. So, <laughs> um, no, we're really excited about this space. I mean, as we grow and as we do more, I mean, uh, more opportunities are presenting themselves. And so we're actually looking at this quite closely. And this is actually demonstrates um, very well the opportunity that's happening in space today, right? So um, uh, we are uh, looking at a company that is um, uh, doing exactly this. Uh, tracking really small pieces of, of objects in space. And it goes, and it's good for uh, understanding where the debris is, and it's good for understanding where satellites are, and it's good for understanding when satellites launch without a license and they weren't supposed to, and it's good for understanding just where things are. We're in this, I mean, you asked, the original question was about a, a space force or border force or something in space, yeah. right? And it's, um, it's tough to do anything if you don't know what's happening up there, right? There was news a couple of weeks ago. There was a Chinese satellite up in the high, lucrative, really expensive satellite orbit, and it maneuvered, and it went somewhere, and we should be really scared about that, right? Should we? I don't know. What are they doing? Um, well, you know, um, who knows? The problem is it could be completely innocent. It could be nefarious. It could be whatever, but, but if you don't know, then it allows for a lot of speculation, right? So in terms of security, just knowing where things are, space situational awareness, awareness, they call it, is really important. Is there like a space security business? Because I know the Air Force has long talked about the need to have a space force. Uh, but is that something the private sector could, well, you know, we're yes. hire us and we'll make sure your satellites are protected. Yeah, I mean, and, and so again, that we're, we're looking at this area very closely and there's private companies today that can track things that are really, really small. And the crazy thing is that they're able to do it. I mean, today, um, to track these, it's a giant radar that costs around $2 billion in you know, a decade to build um, based on the old, uh, old uh, uh, contracting method. And we're able to do track much smaller um, objects in space today at like a thousand times less. What's the, the company you were talking about that, that is I forget, tracking. I'm gonna have to look. Okay, you <laughs> <laughs> can tweet um, it out later. Yeah, no, um, but this is just one example of the opportunity that's happening here, right, is that we've been doing, we've got 60 plus years of technology development in space funded by the government, right? So we have the technology. It's really about entrepreneurs coming in and, and innovating on the business model and saying, you know, wait a second, this is really how you do this? Um, you know, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna do it, um, I'm gonna cut out a lot of the fat 
Um, I'm going to, you know, hire people from outside the industry to do things, to bring in best practices from, I don't know, automotive and, you know, assembly lines or, or what have you. But basically, or using today's technology, throwing an iPhone up or something, right? I mean, we have the technology. It's about how we're using it and how we're thinking about space now from a customer um, uh, centric sort of point of view. Yeah, and to your point, yeah. you know, from the national security, it used to be in the old days, the government used to develop the technology and push it out the industry. But with artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, 3D manufacturing, and the list goes on and on, commercial industry is driving those technologies. And the government realizes that. So now it's a question is how does the government leverage all those things that are going on? So to Chad's point, these same satellites that are being put up to look at the Earth could be looking around the neighborhood and doing neighborhood watch for the benefit of national security and space situational awareness. There are industry opportunities there. Uh, of the $21 billion NASA, I think, had gotten in the budget, how much of that should be NASA as a VC? Uh, huh. And then how much of that should be, in the future, should 50% of that be seed money for other companies and then 50% for the sorts of things that only a government space agency can risk? Right, so um, not really qualified to make that judgment that <laughs> NASA, we sort of implement the policy, we don't make the policy, but I think we could be doing a lot more uh, to helping the private sector. I think as we go forward with NASA, um, at NASA, we will be doing more, but we do have a primary mission, which is exploration. If you look at the NASA Space Act that was created in 1958, our main mission is to explore. So I think that will continue to be the, the lion's share of what we do. But I do think that these partnerships, now that we have a successful model for them, I do believe that we will be doing more of those. We have a stronger private sector now that has the financial and te technical capability uh, to do some of these things. And what we're seeing more recently is the market opportunity. I think 30 years ago, there wasn't a lot of market opportunity in space. It was pretty much just NASA. And I think what is changing now is, um, is that there are other customers. So what I'm trying to accomplish with the commercial crew program is that we don't have the equivalent of an aircraft carrier for these spacecraft. And what I mean by that is the aircraft, an aircraft carrier is a great ship, but it's super expensive and it can only it's optimized for the Navy's mission. We don't want that for the commercial crew program. These spacecraft and human spaceflight vehicles, we don't want them to be so expensive that only governments can afford them and that they're so specialized that it's specialized for the NASA mission. We wanted to make them uh, capable of doing commercial operations. But are there going to be strings attached like, hey, Boeing, hey, SpaceX, great capsule that we bought from you, but don't you cannot sell it to or you're going to have to take this off it before you sell it to another country. Yeah, we didn't uh, we didn't put any of those conditions on the companies. They own the intellectual property uh, associated with um, their spacecraft and launch vehicles, and so they are free to sell them to other customers um, at will. So we, we only have a few more minutes. Should you own what you find? Uh, I know we have a space act where the moon belongs to everybody. Blah blah blah. But if you're a private enterprise, should you <laughs> own what you find on the moon? Should you should you own the real estate where you land on the moon and mine, or on an asteroid? No. <laughs> then why put up the money to go? Well, I, I think that the, the we, there's some good models out there, like uh, Antarctica and other places that have figured out how to do things, but. But I think you should have some rights to own uh, things that, that, and have property rights over certain materials that you uh, generate and do things with. But actually owning a property in space, it gets into tricky territory, right? I mean, who determines that? Under what circumstances? Which countries have interest in that and so forth? And, and I think we've got to think very, very carefully about it. And the Outer Space Treaty is actually a remarkably thoughtful document in this regard. Any thoughts? Because Robert Bigelow doesn't want to spend all that money to get to the moon and mine if he can't get the mining, the mineral rights. Yeah, I think Will's right. This is a really tricky situation. You know, the last thing you want is countries going out and planting the flag and saying, this is now mine and I own this, this territory. Um, that's going to just carry out the kind of battles that we've had here on Earth to other places around yep. the solar system. We don't want that. But I do think there are mechanisms that allow people to find very specific things to be able to sort of carve out, and, and Congress has tried to provide that. So if you can find, let's say, minerals on an asteroid, you could take advantage of that. You can process that, but you can't sort of own celestial yeah. objects. The key, uh, the key okay. is that you can operate in, and this is the legislation <laughs> that was just passed um, 
uh, in 2015 and is being uh, adopted by other countries outside the US as well. And it's like the initial framework for this. And the idea is that you don't get to own property in space. But what you can do is you have the ability to uh, operate your business without being interfered with. So and that's they can't land on step. top of you. And yeah, exactly. If I'm doing right. something, you can't come and bump me or you can't come and start drilling in the same place or whatever the situation might be. I wouldn't be so quick to say no property rights in space or space objects. I do agree uh, that there are models, and, and Antarctica is an interesting one because you don't see a lot of commercial development in Antar Antarctica. I believe there's not a lot going on there, particularly because there are no property rights there. So I do think it is tricky, agree with the whole panel here, but I have seen um, mechanisms and regimes that could be successful with some ownership rights, and I think that has been the key to a lot of economic activity, and we shouldn't just write that off. We just have a couple minutes left. I want to ask each one of you very quickly, what is the one thing that ticks you off that you would like to see changed in the way space development, commercial or on the public side, is happening right now? What, man, if they would just do this? <laughs> uh, uh, well, look, I mean, a lot of stuff's already in the, in the works. Um, the old contracting mechanism of, um, you know, designing something and paying someone a huge sum of money to go out and build this thing um, uh, is not the right incentive model. And it's led to, you know, the bloated programs that we see today that are, you know, uh, cost and time overruns. And we've got really innovative new partnerships like the commercial crew and some other ones and cargo and crew that are working really well. Thanks, where, Chad. Where <laughs> I didn't pay Hon Honestly, that. it's one of the greatest <laughs> things that's happened in space. And it's a great model for the future. And countries around the world look at this and, and want to model themselves after this. But the thing you want changed. So I want that to happen more. Well, faster. <laughs> I want that. I mean, so we're like, we're, we're, we're making, we've made great progress and great um, initial strides, and now I want to see that adopted much, much more. Steve? Um, it's not a policy as much as public awareness. I don't think the public appreciates how much we do in space today. Most people, not some, some people think, oh, I don't need <laughs> GPS. I can tell where I'm going from my iPhone, not realizing that <laughs> GPS is, is what's yep, feeding the iPhone. Yep. So we take things for granted that are in space, and I don't think we fully appreciate it. I think the good news is space is cool again. I think with all the activity that's taking place, that students are lining up at these career fairs, much longer lines than some of the other traditional industries. And I think it's because of the cool things we're doing. I think that, that'll help turn it around. Will? Well, you know, I'm really excited about this new data revolution. And we're primarily dominated by commercial contracts where we sell to ag companies and, and, and uh, consumer mapping companies and the like. But I, I sort of want to echo um, Chad's point that, uh, that um, it, I think it would be great if governments figured out not not, not to tell, ha and haven't been in NASA, I've seen it on both sides, but, but you're not telling people how to build the spacecraft, but instead saying, hey, we just want this data. Can you get us this data? Because uh -huh. then we could go and figure it out far smarter uh, than they can from a lot of the cases. Not all, Then NASA has some really bespoke capabilities that are really amazing for really niche things. But for a lot of the time, they could just say, hey, can you tell us Here's this? Here's the goal. This is the goal. Don't, don't tell us how to build the spacecraft. We're kind of quite good at that now. Um, but like, tell us how to, how, how, what data set you want and, then, and, and how much you're willing to pay, and we'll just supply that. Same for other government departments. And, uh, and, and we would work much closer with government if, if we could have that sort of arrangement, as opposed to their traditional model of saying, hey, this is how you build this bits, and this is what you've got to do here, which we're like, whoa. <laughs> you know. Got it. Jennifer. Uh, I would have to also dovetail on, on your uh, answer as well. It's more about awareness and, and just the appreciation um, for what we're doing on, on the space station. Um, I know there's been a lot of um, interesting, um, uh, I would say, just some perspectives in the media about, about the space station, but... No, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm sort of like, wow, why do we need it? What's it still there? Why don't you commercialize it? And I, I, I'm part of that, like, I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's really, you know, what, and what our organization, what we're trying to drive is, is part of the awareness as well, is that, you know, that this, this is a platform for innovation, for science, for research breakthroughs, and a whole suite of other opportunities and market opportunities. And we're seeing that more and more as, as we're driving the demand since we're on the front lines. Um, and because of the time frame, you know, the, the time really is now to take advantage of it uh, across the board, uh, not just commercial industry, but also gover other government agencies and uh, entrepreneurs, startups, and, and universities. So um, making sure that we can take advantage of, of those subsidies, that we have the availability to, to 
to, you have, uh, I mean, the, the, the space station is your, your platform. You know, the taxpayers are, are paying for it. We need to make sure that we're, uh, we're getting the value that, that we can and, and then also use that as a platform or throughput to then go into the next, you know, as Chad was mentioning earlier about you know, future space stations or outposts um, and, and set that stage for, for what's next and then really make sure that we're bringing that value back down to Earth but also, you know, what that can mean for, for future space exploration and developing this, this really robust uh, marketplace uh, across the board uh, for different industries. We, we wrap up with Phil. How many experiments are going on right now on the space station right at this moment? Do you know? That would be Jennifer. <laughs> I mean, I, I know, but before I go to you, but how, how many? Oh, gosh, almost, as uh, say, between 150 to 200. Jeez. There's okay. lots of, I mean, even uh, if you looked at the numbers from Scott Kelly's, um, uh, Scott and uh, Mark Kelly, they did a twin study where Scott Kelly spent over a year or a little, uh, just under a year in space. And um, and he conducted, I think, over 160 experiments, wow. I think. I saw an infographic recently about that. Okay, Phil, wrap Just him alone. <laughs> That's a, Phil, wrap us up. What is the one thing you want changed? Well, uh, I think it's happening already, and it's what Steve says. Space is cool again. I, I think it's always been cool. I would go to my daughter's career days at her elementary school, and uh, I can tell you I was the most popular guy that day, <laughs> except for the fireman. I hate that guy. Yeah. I mean, he'd bring the fire. Uh, he'd bring the truck. Yeah. I mean, that's not fair. Come on. <laughs> He's my neighbor. I was wanted to put the air out of his tires on career days so I wouldn't have to <laughs> compete with that guy. But all the other parents were jealous of my job because it was super cool, and it got the kids very excited, and I think the problem was as they got older into college, um, trying to figure out their careers and getting a better feel for the aerospace industry, there was a disincentive there because there wasn't a lot happening in space. Uh, I think 10 years ago, we had a phrase about space that it was pale, male, and stale. It's a lot of people wow. like me, right? Wow. And now that is changing <laughs> so much that we have right. young people coming in. It's really a dynamic industry right now, and I think that is feeding on itself. As we get more younger people in, a diversity of, of experiences, a diversity of life uh, experiences in those people coming into the aerospace industry, the space industry, that is accelerating this pace of change and excitement and optimism. I was down at Cape Canaveral when we had this, when uh, SpaceX launched their heavy, um, and I was also there when they brought both of the, both the uh, side boosters back. Same it was time. amazing. Incredible. It was just amazing, and it filled me with a lot of optimism about the future. I think we've been through a couple decades where you didn't really have that, and now the diversity of this panel, the things that are going on, super exciting. I want that to happen faster, more now. That's what I'd like wow. to Wow, great final words. Thanks, everybody. That's Thank awesome. you. Oh, right. <laughs>